Former well, British Ambassador to Russia, should we, uh, Sir Tony Brenton. Hello to you, Sir Tony. It's good to see you again. Thank you for joining us on the programme this morning. Um, first of all, should we just start with the latest situation uh, in the Donbass region? It does look as though, I mean, initially when the, the war first broke out, we thought this was the region that Russia would be most interested in. They had a scattergun approach, but now consolidating in that area. How surprised are you? Yeah, no, I'm not surprised. This has been pretty clearly coming for a few weeks, as the Russians have been, after failing in their initial assaults on Kiev, have been reorganising to go precisely for the Donbass. The Donbass is the logical place for them to go for. One of the claims they've made in, in launching the war was to protect the population of the Donbass from what they describe as Ukrainian genocide. I'm sorry. That's OK. As long as it's not President Putin, we can wait. No, no, no. OK, I've killed it. Um, They've so th this was predictable. It is now launched, and it is as your correspondent Deborah, I think, said. Probably we're now at the decisive phase of the war because one of two things can happen: either they succeed in in the Donbass and take that region, in which case they've got a huge negotiating um, uh, ploy. <laughs> Um, they've got a huge negotiating ploy to use with the, um, the Ukrainians in any, in any discussions that might then take place, or there is a danger that Putin may revive his earlier ambition of going again for Kiev and going for the whole of Ukraine, in effect. Yeah. The alternative, and I suspect more likely, um, of course, is that this thing is going to get bogged down as their previous offensive gets bogged down. You're in for a quite long war of attrition between the two sides, at which point both sides at some point will begin looking for a negotiated outcome. But we'll have to see. A lot now depends immensely on how the military campaign goes. Yeah. Uh, has it not been proven um, or have we not seen that um, Ukraine, Ukrainian fighters um, are more than what uh, President Putin was expecting? They have uh, suffered heavy defeats, uh, both with their armoury and indeed with their military personnel as, as well. And, and trying to take over the whole of Ukraine is not feasible. Well, it was not feasible in that, on their original um, approach, which was to send their troops in every every possible direction. Whether it is feasible to take the Donbass and then proceed from there remains to be seen. Uh, as I say, I, I think the likelihood is not. And yes, we all got it wrong initially. The chief of the US general staff said at the very beginning that the Russians were likely to be able to take Kiev in 72 hours. So lots of military experts have got egg on their face about the incapacity of the Russians to win the war as they initially fought it. The, the big question is whether they've, they've resolved the, the, the incompetence that they showed the first time round. They found themselves, as you said, up against a much more effective and cohesive and high morale Ukrainian armed force than they expected, and also a, a Ukrainian armed force which has been massively armed, and the UK has had a lot to do with this, by the West, which has made a very big difference to their ability to uh, to, to uh, advance. Talk to me about, I mean, we, we said that you were um, the ambassador to Russia uh, in, I think, 2004 to 2008, I think. That's I'm right, insane. Yes. Mr. Ambassador, I'm sure you must have met Putin in that time. Um, what sort of man, how do you remember him and how do you think he'll be dealing with what's happening in Ukraine at the moment? Well, how I remember him is as a very able, focused, not very nice um, leader of Russia, driven by the desire to make Russia great again, to coin, coin a phrase, uh, and a man who took risks but calculated rather carefully before taking them. Very clearly, the, the, the Putin we're dealing with now is in some significant ways different, that he has launched this, he's taken this huge risk of this war. I think he's been brooding over his isolation from COVID about Ukraine, which he sees as central to making Russia great again, and has launched this war, which it looks very unlikely that he could win, he can win on the terms that he originally set for himself. So he's disappointed, I suspect. He's angry. He's talked a couple of times about going nuclear, which would be a very big threshold to cross if he went for it. But I wouldn't rule it out entirely if things go very badly wrong for him. So I suspect that what we need to be doing is persuading, if not him personally, then the people around him, that there is a, a respectable way out of this for Russia and which preserves Ukraine. And we need to be edging our way towards that. So does the West have to give him, from what you're saying, some sort of get out, of, get out clause so that he won't use potentially nuclear weapons? Is that what you're saying? Let me give you a little bit of history. Back in 1962, 
President John F. Kennedy, dealing with the Cuban Missile Crisis, said that what the United States absolutely must not do is confront a nuclear armed um, adversary, by which he meant the Soviet Union at the time, with the choice between total humiliation and nuclear escalation. That remains as true today as it was when he said it. Yes, the Russians have behaved appallingly. Yes, the political um, feel of dealing with a country which has committed so many atrocities and so many illegalities is going to be very hard. But if the alternative is to move across the nuclear threshold, then we're going to have to bite our tongues a bit and do it. In the meantime, what about these two British fighters? As far as the British government is concerned, via the Northern Ireland Secretary this morning, you know, they're, they're, they're there illegally. Um, and it does sound as though they're on their own for now. Russia wants to do a deal, a, a, a prisoner swap deal, if you will, with a, with a Ukrainian uh, uh, MP, former leader of the opposition in Ukraine. Um, what do you think Putin will do about these two? I think he probably sees them as negotiating material for use with us. Um, we, in Putin's eyes, are among the most um, uh, rabid of the West's opponents to Russia. Um, they are useful for discussions as part of what eventually we all hope will be a, be, a, be a peace negotiation. What we, there are some things we obviously need to be doing. We need to be seeking consular access to them to make sure that they're being treated decently. We need to make it sure, we need to make it clear to Putin that indeed their fate will form part of whatever negotiation we eventually end up in. And if they are maltreated, then that will form part of our attitude in those negotiations. But in terms of getting them out quickly, barring a, a real change of mood on the part of the Russians, I don't think that that's very likely to happen. OK. So, Tony, um, fascinating stuff. Um, I'll let you get back to your phone call. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Sorry about us. that. Much Thank appreciated. you. Not at all. Thank you for joining us. Right. Bye-bye.